Good morning, church family. How are we doing today? Oh, that was terribly weak. Y'all might be the biggest service, but you're also the quietest. Welcome to Worship at Johnson Ferry. My name is John Wellborn, and I'm excited to be your guest preacher for the day, and I'm excited to continue the series that you've been in over the last several weeks uh, called Parables. So if you have a Bible, take it and turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 7. We'll jump in there in just a few minutes, but I'm excited about this message. Actually, chapter 14, verse 7 is where we'll be. Uh, I am from uh, New York, and I am bringing you greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ in New York City. Did you know you had brothers and sisters in Christ in New York City? I don't know if you did or not, but you do. You have many. There's many, 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 many of us. And I am from, as Pastor Clay mentioned, this area. Went to Sixes Elementary School in Canton, Georgia, just north of here. Went to Parkview High School in Gwinnett County. Uh, Go Panthers. And I uh, was grateful for, for this sort of where I'm from, but I'm also grateful to where God's called me to. I, uh, I've been living in the last eight years in New York, and as I've traveled around, I've discovered there's a few misconceptions, even some rumors about New York that you might have heard before. How many of you ever heard the rumor that New Yorkers are rude? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you heard that? New Yorkers are rude. Okay, all right, about half of you are claiming you've heard that rumor before. Can I help you with that? New Yorkers are not rude. We're just in a hurry. Okay, we're just in a hurry. Now, you know about traffic in Atlanta, but what you might not know about is if you miss that train by one minute, that means you're going to miss that bus by five minutes, which means you're going to miss that ferry by 30 minutes. And so a one minute delay could translate into like an hour and a half being late to work. So they're just in a hurry. Another thing I've discovered is that most people that think New Yorkers are rude either have never been there or when they've gone there, they've had a misunderstanding of, of where they are. So when I ask somebody, they say, well, New Yorkers are rude. I'll say, well, okay, well, have you been to New York? Oh, yes, I've been there. And they were rude to you? Yeah, they were rude to me. Okay, tell me where you went that they were rude to you. And they would say, well, we went to the Statue of Liberty and we went to Times Square and uh, we went to the Empire State Building. I'm like, <laughs> there's not a New Yorker that would be caught dead in any one of those places. They would happen to you. <laughs> is you went to all the tourist places and you probably were treated poorly by some tourists from, oh, I don't know, Marietta, Georgia. <clears throat> and then you came back home and told everybody New Yorkers are rude. That's what happens in New York. All the tourists get together, you're mean to each other, and then you go home thinking New Yorkers are rude. New Yorkers are not rude. In fact, uh, it's, it's an incredible place. I'm grateful for where I'm from here but I'm also grateful for the mission field to which God has called me and my home in New York City. Let me tell you something else I'm grateful for. I am so very grateful for you. One of the reasons I was so eager to take a Sunday away from my home church in New York to come here to preach uh, as a part of this parable series and, and to, to fill in for my friend, uh, Pastor Clay, was because I wanted a chance to stand before you and to say thank you. Thank you for your investment into New York City. Thank you for your commitment to the long haul ministry there. Thank you for being willing to be the kind of church that's willing to sacrifice things that you could do and things that you may want here in your home base to send more resources, more people, and more gospel to the ends of the earth. I want you to know I love you. I don't know you, but I love you, and I'm so very thankful for you, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to open the Word of God with you this morning. All right? So let's dive in. If you have a Bible, Luke chapter 14, I'm going to start this message by showing you the kingdom of God as a party, a kingdom party. I love a good party. Do you love a good party? If you do, say, uh-huh. <clears throat> we always love good parties. I mean, how could you not love a party? The food's on point. The host has done a good job to make it a lot of fun. All the right people are there. Men, you can relate to this. We think it's a good party if there's something to do. Women can enjoy a good party and just talk to each other the whole time, but men, we need something to do. We need a dart to throw. We need a fire to poke, right? We need a game to watch. If a man's going to enjoy a party, we need something to do, right, guys? It can't just be standing around looking at each other, all right? We're not that attractive, so you've got to have something to do. Well, good parties are all over the Bible. Do you know that? You do, do this sometimes. Go to the Bible and try to, try to find out how many parties Jesus attended. Every time you turn around, you find Jesus going to a wedding feast. You find Jesus going to a, a, a you know, to a, to a, a, a celebration, to a, a, to, to a, a gathering, to a, he was a party, he was a party animal, quite frankly. Jesus went to party after party after party after party. In fact, he went to so many parties, there were times he was accused of excess. He was accused of excess, too many feasts, too many parties. Listen to Matthew 11. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said he has a demon. 
But the Son of Man came eating and drinking and said, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and of sinners, yet wisdom is justified by, uh, by her deeds. See, Jesus loved parties, especially, especially when that party would include the outcasts, when that party included people nobody else wanted. Jesus loved a good party, especially if it gave him a chance to make a point and to minister and to teach. Now, before all of you teenagers, I'm told the students are over here. Is this the youth over here, teenagers? You guys, give me a thumbs up. You guys good? Good to have you over here. Before you use this to go to your parents and say, all right, mom, let me go to the party. Jesus loves parties. Amen? The preacher just said it. I'm supposed to go to parties to be Christ-like. Okay, I understand the point, but let's, let's be careful about that because Jesus went to the party with a plan. Like, he kind of went to the party with a plan. He went to the party, and he would drastically change the dynamic. He would do something unique to challenge people, to teach people, and to do something special. It certainly wasn't to let loose or act crazy at a point to make. One of the amazing things about Jesus and parties is how many times Jesus likened the kingdom of heaven to a party. How many times Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. The kingdom of heaven is like a great banquet. We're going to see in just a moment. Jesus uses a party to make a point about the kingdom of God. Whenever you think about the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, is a party what comes to mind to you? It wasn't to me to begin with. When I think of the kingdom of heaven, a lot of times what came to mind to me years ago was, well, there's a set of rules, right? The kingdom of God is about what to do and what not to do. And if you're going to be a part of the kingdom, then you have to not do those things and do, do those things. When I think about the kingdom of God, I, I, sometimes I think about the kingdom of heaven. I think about, okay, we're going to go to heaven one day and we're going to sit on a cloud and strum a harp and, you know, just sing to each other forever and ever and ever. And that doesn't sound like heaven or a party to me. Maybe to you, I don't know. But the kingdom of God is constantly likened to a party, and Jesus uses this party concept as a backdrop to teach us something about humility and teach us something about the kingdom of God. Let me give you the context to, to this passage in Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus has been invited to a, you guessed it, to a party. He's been invited to a party, and this is a unique kind of party. This is a Sabbath day party. Not only that, it's a Sabbath day party at a Pharisee's house. Pharisees were deeply religious people who abided by the law as strictly as they possibly could. And so the Pharisee invited Jesus and all of his Pharisee friends and all of his wealthy friends came together for this Sabbath day party. But it wasn't just a party. They came together to pay attention and watch Jesus. Verse 1 of chapter 14 says that they were all watching him carefully. The reason they were watching him carefully is because the Pharisee had set up this party to trap Jesus. The whole point was a farce. He'd gone out into the street. He'd found a man with dropsy, which was a disease that was terribly painful. Fluid built up in the fingers and toes, feet, hands, arms, and legs. This man was living a miserable life with a condition of dropsy. They'd gone out and found some random sick man from the street. They'd taken him into the Pharisee's home, and they'd sat him at the party, a party they never would have invited this guy to under normal circumstances. They brought him in. They sat him right next to Jesus, and then everybody in the room was watching Jesus what is he going to do? The reason they wanted to know is because healing on the Sabbath was supposed to be illegal. In addition, if Jesus is sitting there next to somebody that's in terrible pain and horrible sickness, and he has the ability to heal him and he doesn't, then obviously Jesus doesn't love him. It was a trap. It was a trap. Everybody say trap. 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 It's a party. It's a trap. They brought Jesus into this trap. So what happens? Well, Christ, of course, recognizes it. In verse number three, he says, and Jesus responds to the lawyers and the Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? He took their trap, turned it around on them. So what do you say? Should I heal this guy or should I not? Is it lawful for me to heal him on the Sabbath or is it okay? You tell me what you think. And what does it say? It says, but they remained silent. So what does Jesus do? The scripture says, then Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. Probably the guy wanted to leave from the beginning. He didn't want to be there to start with. But Jesus healed him and sent him on his way. You see, that's the kind of stuff Jesus does at parties. That's the kind of things Jesus does to illustrate the kingdom of heaven. The title of my message today for you is this, is a kingdom party. But another title for the message today could be, could be this. I could, I could have entitled the message, Jesus makes parties awkward. Amen? <laughs> right? Or how about this? Jesus ruins parties. Every time, he shows up and points things out, and then nobody's having any fun anymore. But today, I want to show you a kingdom party from Luke chapter 14. At our church in New York, we do this. I hope you'll join me. If you're physically able, would you stand with me now out of respect for the reading of God's Word? Starting in verse number 7 from Luke chapter 14, 
Let's hear from the word of God. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished, than, more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher, then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted." He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reality that your kingdom is a party. It's a party with specific people invited and specific people hosting, and Lord, it's a party that we all want to be a part of, but God, all of us live in tension because we want to have our party, uh, what we'd like to have there, who we'd like to have there, and what we'd like to have going on, and so we live in tension, Father. We live in this constant state of conflict with our flesh and the spirit, so today, in the few minutes we have in the word, I pray that you'd lead us to a place of confidence that your kingdom party is where we want to be, and your kingdom party is what we want to facilitate on earth as it is in heaven, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. The main idea of the message I have for you today is this. A kingdom party, it requires humility for all involved. A kingdom party requires humility for all involved. And there are two groups of people that Jesus talks to in these two parables that I think you're going to relate to. The first group of people that he talks to are the guests, and Jesus calls for humble guests. A kingdom party requires humble guests. Jesus observed something unique as this party was getting started. He noticed that when the doors opened to the dining room or the doors opened to the party hall, people would shove in and go as fast as they could to get the front of the room. They wanted to sit next to the host. Because the closer you were to the host, the more important you were. The closest you were to the one who was most important in the room made you more important. So if you were going to get in the room, you would want to push your way to the front to sit as close to the host as possible so everybody at the party would know just how important you were. This was cultural capital at that time. Everyone was trying to level up. And in order to level up, you needed to be in the right seats at the right party so that you could establish your social standing. What Jesus said instead was, hey, everyone here, again, Jesus ruins parties. Hey, everybody here who shoved up to get to the front of this party, here's what you should do instead. Instead, you should have sat in the back of the party, the back of the room, and then if you were important enough that the host wanted you up to the front, then they would have come and invited you. Instead, some of you got humiliated because you took a better seat, but you got demoted to a lesser seat because because you're not as important as you think you are. Again, Jesus makes parties awkward, amen? Very, very awkward. It, it, the fact of the matter is, if you get invited to honor, that's great, but never presume it, never presume it. Albert Einstein once says, try not to become a man of success, but instead try to become a man of value. A great preacher from last generation, Adrian Rogers, once said, worry about your character, but let God worry about your reputation. That seems to be what Christ is emphasizing here. In the book of Proverbs, King Solomon addresses this same concept in verse 6 of chapter 25 when he says, do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be called come up here than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. And Jesus' point is quite simply this. If we're going to have a kingdom party where the kingdom reigns and the kingdom rules, then that means guests must be humble. I'm grateful to have some of my family here with me in this service. So I preached the first two, they weren't here, but I have my mom, my sister, my other sister, my niece, and even my little boy Charlie is right over there. Can you wave at me, Charlie? What's up, big guy? This is my family. They're local, Ackworth, uh, Woodstock, and, and I'm so grateful to, to be able to hang out with them for a few days. My, my uh, father passed away a couple of years ago. He was a pastor over in Kennesaw uh, up until the week he passed. He preached the Sunday before he had his uh, health event that eventually uh, cost him his life, but he pastored all throughout my childhood years. Matter of fact, when I was in uh, high school, in middle school, he was pastoring a church over in Norcross, not far from Jimmy Carter Boulevard, 95, and, and he and my mom got invited to go to a big banquet down at the Georgia World Congress Center. You guys have probably been there before. It's a huge, huge venue. And the event was for Christian leaders in Atlanta. There was a major speaker, a senator from the U.S. 
uh, 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 Senate, uh, the, the U.S. Congress came and was going to be speaking. So the head table, the senator was there, very important uh, leaders from around Atlanta, Christian leaders from around Atlanta were gathered there, and they'd invited pastors and Christian leaders from all the city to come. So mom and dad arrive, and when they get there, they seat them at a table that was as far away from the stage as it could possibly be. I mean, they were basically seated in the men's room, weren't they, that day? I mean, they were as far back as you could possibly be. They were assigned to that table. So mom and dad went over to that table and sat down, and people were coming in and finding their way, and everybody was, you know, talking and shaking hands and working the room and networking, but they're just sitting there quietly. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, an older gentleman came up and sat down at their table and began to talk to them and began to ask them questions. And dad describes how for the next 10 minutes, this gentleman made them feel like they were the most important people on planet Earth. He asked them about their marriage, about their church, about their kids, about their lives. And my dad was a talker. I mean, he was a real talker, but he couldn't hardly get a word in edgewise as this older gentleman sat there and talked to them and cared for them and listened to them and was such an incredibly gracious man. They had no idea who he was. They didn't know who he was. So finally, when given the opportunity, my dad said, I'm sorry, sir. I'm Alan. This is my wife, Sandy. You know, we pastor in Norcross. Uh, what's your name? He said, oh, I'm Truett Cathy. I work at Chick-fil-A. <laughs> now, now if, if I was in New York, I'd have to explain to everybody who Truett Cathy is and what Chick-fil-A is, but I'm not. I'm in Atlanta. Everybody knows who Truett Cathy is, the founder of Chick-fil-A, probably the most influential Christian businessman in our city at that time. Well, he sat there and continued to engage with them until someone from the platform saw, oh my goodness, true, Kathy's at the back. They freaked out and they went running back there to get him. They came back and said, oh, Mr. Kathy, we have a seat for you next to the senator. We have a table prepared for you. Come with us and we will seat you at a table appropriate for who you are. And dad tells the story that Mr. Kathy was gracious and turned around to mom and dad and said, uh, they've asked me to go to another table, but I'd like to ask your permission if it's not okay with you, I'd love to sit here with you the rest of the night. But if it's okay with you, would it, could I go to the table they prepared for me? And dad and mom said, of course, you, you can do what you need to do, Mr. Kathy. It's been a joy talking to you. He said, thank you very much. And he got up and he walked his way to the front of the room and sat next to the senator for the rest of the night. And as he walked away, dad quoted this passage. When you go to a banquet, don't sit at the head table. Be asked to come to the head table. Live in such humility that you have a correct estimation of oneself. And until he died, he told that story over and over and over again. Because Not because it's, it's, it's the Chick-fil-A way, it's because it's Christ-like. It's Christ-like to have a correct estimation of yourself and to defer, especially in settings like that one. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12 says, As put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Now, here's what you need to understand. Jesus is not giving us party etiquette, all right? He's not just saying, hey, when you go to a party, here's how you behave. He's not just telling us things we need to know so we don't embarrass ourselves at parties. Jesus is speaking to the Jews at this point about the social capital of the day. He's saying this is social capital. You are pressing forward to get ahead. You're doing everything you can to be important. These are the things that matter to you. You need to understand how much they don't matter in the kingdom of heaven. He's not trying to, tra he's not trying to change the way we attend parties. He's trying to change our value system. He's trying to show us what really matters and what really doesn't matter. So for you and I, living in the year 2023, what is the social capital of our day? It's not where we sit at parties. That's not the social capital of our day. Don't leave this room thinking, okay, well, I know how to behave next time I get invited to a wedding. That's not what this is about. This is about addressing the question of social capital, social capital that can be borne out in the cars we drive, in the houses and neighborhoods in which we choose to live, social capital borne out in the kind of clothes we wear, the kind of flexibility we have and the vacations we take. Social capital borne out in the kind of cosmetic procedures we choose to undertake. Social capital borne out in what kind of, 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 of uh, career path we take, what kind of schools we go to, what kind of choices we make with jewelry or with other status symbols. Everything I just mentioned is not inherently sinful. It's not sinful to drive a nice car. It's not wrong to live in a nice house in a nice neighborhood. It's not wrong to have, have a certain uh, you know, jewelries or things like this. They're not sinful, but, but Jesus invites us to understand all of the things that we think put us ahead may in fact put us behind in the kingdom of God. Let me give you a framework. If you're taking notes, you may want to ask these three questions. 
three questions you want to ask. They're not on the notes. I, if I had this outline to do again, I'd have put these in the notes for you. But three questions you need to ask. When it comes to something that I'm going to do that, that may help me level up, when it comes to something that I'm going to do, may, may, whether that's to get a, a nicer house, whether it's to buy a newer car, whether it's to make a job change, whether it's to, to, to have a procedure done or, or to do something that, that's going to help me level up, it's going to help me get to the next stage of my life, my social standing, and, and, and give off vibes of success. There's three questions you need to ask. Number one, why do you want it? Why do you want it? Why do you want another car? Why do you want a bigger house? Why do you want that kind of vacation? Why? What's the purpose behind it? Try to get to the root of what you want it for. What's the purpose of that? Now, again, there, I'm not saying you have to live in a shack and drive a jalopy to be godly. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what I'm teaching. But I do think motive matters as much as anything as it relates to the kingdom of God. So why? Why? Second thing is what are you willing to do to get it? What am I willing to do to get it? Let's say I want to drive a nice new car. Well, that's going to be more expensive. What am I willing to sacrifice to get that nice new car? Am I willing to sacrifice time with my family because I've got to work longer hours to pay the cost of the car? That's not a good sacrifice. That's not a good trade. Maybe I back off on how much I'm giving and tithes and offerings to my local church in order to pay for these. That's not a good trade either. I get to the bottom of why I want it, then I get to the bottom of what it is I'm willing to give up to get it. It's going to give me a window into my heart. And then finally, thirdly, what am I going to do with it once I have it? What am I going to do with it once I have it? And there's a kingdom answer to all three of those questions. More importantly, there's a non-kingdom answer to all three of those questions. And whenever we answer them in non-kingdom answers, and that genuinely is the cry of our heart, it is time to say, no, not now, not this, not this way. See, here's the thing. The host in this opening parable, it's God. And God is not impressed with our ambition. In fact, directly the opposite. In Luke chapter 13, verse 30, Jesus says, And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. And here's the thing, dear friends. All of these things we call status symbols, all the things that are social capital, all the things that we think are getting us ahead in the kingdom of God, those are the very things that are putting us in the back. They're putting us behind it may advance us in this life, but the kingdom, which goes on forever and ever and ever, is placing us at a disadvantage. And a kingdom party requires humility from everyone involved. Number two, y'all okay? Everybody all right? They told me 1130 was the most rambunctious, exciting crowd, you know, but I feel like I'm kind of, I'm kind of, kind of feeling you kind of, like, you know, kind of shrink back a little bit. I'm not, I'm not smacking you around. I'm a, I'm a guest preacher, which means I get, to, I get to come in here and create all kinds of problems, and I get to go back to New York, and your pastor gets to solve all of them, okay? So that's the joy of being a guest preacher, all right? So y'all join me in that. Number, number two, first kind of uh, participant in a kingdom party is a humble guest. Secondly, he talks about humble hosts, verses 12 through 14. See, while Jesus is making the party awkward, while Jesus is ruining the party and making it more of a kingdom party, he turns his attention to the hosts. So he talks to the guests, and now he talks to the hosts. He's invited, the host has invited all of his rich friends, except that guy with dropsy, everybody else. He's invited all of his rich friends. Why did he invite rich friends to his party? Well, because he was either paying them back for a party they had invited him to, or he was trying to get them in his debt so that they would invite him to their parties in the future. And Jesus says to the host, that's the wrong way to go. If you're going to have a party, don't invite those people who are the most important, the most influential, the most wealthy. If you're going to invite, have a party, you need to invite people who can never repay you. You know why? Because if you serve, if you love, if you are generous to people that can never give it back to you, guess what you have? You have stored up treasure in heaven. That's what you've done. But to do it the way you're doing it, by just inviting people that can invite you back and just blessing people who can bless you back, you have basically guaranteed you have gotten your reward and you've gotten it now and you've gotten it in full. But here's the thing. The Jews living in Jesus' day would have said to Christ, that is financial suicide right there because back in those days... That's where business was done. Business was done in parties. Business was done around a table. Business was all about who you knew. And so in these parties, it wasn't just food and drink and fun. It was business deals going down. People were brokering major, major deals. And so to avoid that and to reject that mechanism of, of doing business, they would say it's like financial suicide. It's definitely social suicide. There's no way to level up without playing the game as it relates to parties. And Jesus says, don't play the game and forget about leveling up. They had a mindset that was wrong. 
They thought that whatever they gave to the poor was gone forever. They thought that whatever they sacrificed for the kingdom of God, it was gone to them forever, but it wasn't. In fact, it wasn't. Jesus wasn't calling them to poverty. Jesus was calling them to a wiser investment, a wiser investment. About 170 years ago, it became clear it became clear that the Confederate States of America were going to be dissolved. Civil War was coming to an end. The Union was going to win, and therefore the CSA would no longer exist. And that was a problem for people who were a part of the CSA on a lot of levels. But one of the areas that was the most difficult as it relates to the end of the Civil War was that a lot of people down this part of the country, they still had Confederate money. This Confederate money was going to be useless. In just a few weeks, just a few months, the money would be useless because the, the, it was a currency of a kingdom that was passing away. If you're with me, say, uh-huh. Right? You guys there? You all right? The kingdom was passing away, so the currency of that kingdom was going to be useless to them. So what did smart people do? Smart people took their Confederate money and they exchanged it as fast as they could. As fast as they could. Exchange, 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 exchange. For what? For American dollars. Exchange it for money that's a part of a kingdom that is not passing away. That's what smart people had to do because eventually this currency was going to be useless. Hear me, dear friends. All of the currency of our culture is passing away. You understand? A hundred years from now, nobody cares what kind of car we drive. Amen? A hundred years from now, it won't matter how beautiful our house was. A million years from now, nobody will remember anything we had done uh, in cosmetic surgery. They'll remember nothing as it relates to the promotion or the vacations we went on. Everything that we think matters today, the money, the assets, the abilities, it is all currency of a kingdom that is passing away. But the kingdom of God is forever and ever and ever. He has a kingdom from everlasting to everlasting. It will never pass away. So anything we invest into his kingdom is something we have not lost, but in fact, we've invested in such a way, it'll go on forever and ever and ever and ever. And it is a wise investment to make his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are you with me, Johnson Ferry Baptist Church? Yes, celebrate that. Now we're getting going, yeah? Does it feel, feel happening? I feel like some of y'all are some of my Puerto Rican Pentecostals from Staten Island made your way down here. Come on. Praise God. Listen, dear friends, this is one of the reasons I love your church so much. Oh, I love your church so much. I love it, love it, love it, love it. Because you get it. Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Matthew 6, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because moth and rust destroy them, and thieves break in and steal them. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth or rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's calling for an inverse of the, of the common thinking. It's one of the reasons I love your church. It's one of the reasons I love your pastor because you understand as a church family, they just told me a minute ago that 17 to 20% of everything you guys receive as a church family gets sent out into the mission of God around the world, including places like New York City. I love you for that. I love because so many Bible Belt suburban churches don't see that. And they invest everything in themselves, bigger buildings, nicer spaces, bigger things, nicer stuff. It's constantly about them but yet God has given you and positioned you uniquely to be sacrificially generous to the kingdom of God. You've got incredible facilities here. Last time I was here with my wife and my kids, the, the whole foyer out there was torn down. It was a construction zone out there. And now I get to come back and I see how beautiful it is. And that's a beautiful foyer. You know how much more beautiful it could be if you didn't send millions of dollars to the mission fields? You don't think that way. And I love you for it. Fact of the matter is you don't think that way. You think, what do we need here to do what God's called us to do here? But how can we get more resources to the ends of the earth to advance the kingdom, to plant churches and make disciples in the end of the earth? How can we engage in the mission of God in a more radically generous way? I love you for that. I love you for that. I texted my entire Send New York staff this morning. I'm going to go tell Johnson Ferry Baptist Church how much we love them and how much we need them for the mission God's called us to in New York City. Thank you. You understand the principle Warren Wiersbe describes that you can't get your reward twice. You can't take the reward now and have it later. In fact, you only get it once, and you've chosen wisely. So here's the question I gotta ask you as I wrap up my message. What is it exactly 
that God is calling you to offer on the altar as a sacrificial gift to his kingdom. Another way to say it is this. What is your social standing that is the equivalent of a Jew inviting wealthy people to his party so he can get invited for their party or another person jockeying their way to the front of a party to show how important they are, what is it that God is calling out of you and me that we would be sacrificing for his kingdom's sake to make our party more of a kingdom party? I grew up in kind of southern mega church culture. I was ordained at a massive church in the north side of Atlanta, not far from here licensed there as well. I was sent off to Liberty University, trained very, very well, Bible, theology, preaching, all those things. I'm grateful for where I came from, but I, I believed some things that were not healthy in the early stages of my life in ministry. I believed early on that there are markers of success for a pastor. And those markers were more people coming to hear me preach. Those markers were bigger church to call my own. Those markers were, 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 were hundreds and hundreds of baptisms. Those markers were book deals. Those markers were speaking invitations at the circuits. I, I believe some things growing up in a certain culture that just simply weren't true, that the markers of success for a pastor or a preacher or a minister were things that were very, very tangible, touchable. It wasn't so much about faithfulness. You wanted to be faithful, but it was almost like, well, if you are faithful, then everything you touch will explode with growth and be massive. And I believe that. And God called me when I was 27 years old to pastor a little church in the poultry capital of America, and it smelled like it too. <laughs> we moved to Harrisonburg, Virginia, and, uh, and to a little church of 90 people. <laughs> and it was a struggle, a challenge. Very, very difficult season of ministry. But even in the course of that, God blessed it and it began to grow. And before long, what came? The buildings came and the crowds came and the opportunities came and all those kinds of things. And stuff was beginning to move and it was starting to materialize. Everything I believed and learned as a teenage and young, young adult preacher boy, yeah, you do it, you do it right. It's going to grow, it's going to blow up, it's going to be huge. And these are the markers of success. These are the markers of social standing. And the Lord began to stir my heart and my wife's heart about the possibility of relocating into the city of New York. Step into a church that was 120 years old, had a building that was about 70 years old, had 56 parking spaces, 56 parking spaces, which that is a huge parking lot where I come from, by the way. It's a really big one. We've never seen parking like this out here. Like, we don't know what to do with that. I, I parked over in Alabama to walk to this building today. <laughs> We don't know what to do with that. But listen, dear friends, I, I, we began to pray through that, and, and things became clear to me as I was praying through this call to New York City, and that was every single thing I'd ever considered to be a marker of ministry success was going to be completely unattainable and most likely impossible if I said yes to God's call on my life to move to that city. And therefore, the metric for success had to change, and I had to repent. God called Ashley and I to lay on the altar of God everything we'd always ever equated with success and say, we don't care if it ever comes true or not. We want to be obedient to you, and we want to advance the kingdom as an act of worship. Look at me, dear friends. How have you gauged success? And are you ready to surrender it to God as an act of worship to advance his kingdom instead of your own? That's what a kingdom party looks like. You know, your pastor is one of the, my favorite preachers. He's a phenomenal expositor. You know that about Clay. He's incredible. I listen to guys that are older than me. I listen to some guys that are around my age, and Clay's around my age. I listen to guys that are behind me too. But of the guys that are my age, I love listening to your preacher as much as anybody. He's an incredible, incredible preacher. And one of the things that an incredible preacher knows what to do is how to conclude a message, right? 
how to, how to wrap it up. And usually there's a really good visual. There's a good illustration. There's something that gives us a really good description, kind of wraps it all up, a nice story, something that's very, very emotional maybe, very vivid. And, and I was looking for one for this message. I was looking for one. I want to get down there to Georgia. I want to preach to my friends at Johnson Ferry. I want to have a good concluding illustration. So I looked in books and I read articles and I went to the search and I, I, I just did all I could think of to come up with a really good, really good concluding illustration and I really couldn't. So I went to the Lord in prayer. I'm like, God, I've got to help me. I don't know how to wrap up this message. I know they're going to want want me to wrap it up, but I don't know how to wrap it up. And he he kept pointing me back to something very powerful. He kept pointing me back uh, to Jesus. He said, John, if you're talking about humility, there's no greater example than Christ. If you're talking about someone who laid aside prerogative, there's nobody better than Jesus. Jesus said about himself in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he said this, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, what? But to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You understand there's nobody in the world that deserved to be served more than Jesus. If you're with me, say amen. Nobody deserved to be served more than Jesus, but nobody was quicker to sit at the table in the men's room faster than Jesus, amen? It's Jesus. Paul describes Jesus in his incredible humility in Philippians chapter two. Powerful, powerful. Paul's describing the humility of Jesus. He's describing just how amazing he is, not just in the example that he gives. Jesus is our example of humility, but he's also the one that gives us the power to be humble. Notice what he says when he says this, do nothing from selfish ambition or from vain conceit. Instead, in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves. Look not each one only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Church, would you read out loud this bolded verse five with me all together from the back of the bleachers to the front row, nice and loud, one, two, three, ready? Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. The humility of a kingdom party is not something you work on. It's not something you muster up. It's not something you bring about by self-will. It's something that Jesus gives to you when he saves you, and you just need to surrender to it. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours in Christ Jesus. He goes on to describe Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form. He humbled himself of become obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Thank God he did, amen? Thank God Jesus humbled himself, amen? Church, do you know the importance of Jesus humbling himself? The importance if he doesn't, if Jesus does not humble himself, If he does not go to the cross, then guess what? We have no hope. We can't be saved. We can't be forgiven. If Jesus does not set aside his divine prerogative and go to the cross and pay the price for our sins, if he does not rise from the dead three days later, then you and I are to be pitied above all people. Our faith is in vain. Our preaching is in vain. We have nothing. We are completely hopeless without the humility of Christ Jesus willing to die in our place and on our account. Jesus humbled himself, and he calls us to humble ourselves. The kingdom party requires humility for all who are involved. So here's my invitation, and I'm done. If you're here today and there's never been a time in your life where you've turned from your sin, placed your faith and trust in Jesus to save you, then you're being called to humility. To humble yourself, to say, yep, I can't save myself. There's no way. There's no way I can forgive myself. There's no way I can can change my life on my own. Humble yourself enough to say, I need Jesus. For those of you that are here that have been saved, I was saved February the 21st, 1993, at a little Baptist church in Canton, Georgia. From that moment, some 30 years ago, till this moment, every single day is a battle. It's a war between two kingdoms. Is it going to be my kingdom that I build today? Or is it going to be his kingdom that I build today? Is it going to be my kingdom come, my will be done? Or is it going to be his kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven? And it's only through humility are we laying aside our definitions of success and our kingdom and saying, Lord, by your grace and for your glory, (laughs) 
It's about you. It's about you. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the privilege of bringing the word to my, my friends and brothers and sisters here at Johnson Ferry Baptist Church today. God, I thank you for the awesome privilege it is to, to play a part in this series about the parables of Christ Jesus. And Lord, I thank you for the incredible gift your word is and the even greater gift your son is. So Lord, in Jesus' name, would you lead us to a place of even more kingdom humility, not false humility, but kingdom humility, and that we would lay aside our own definitions of success and instead take up the mantle of Christ Jesus and his humble servitude to you and to your purposes. And Lord, that you make us a kingdom people, a kingdom party every time we gather, where the last shall be first and the first shall be last. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen. Church, would you just stay in a spirit of...